Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of SAS Leaders Lounge and today we've got a special guest Rosie Petrova, Shara Lambus. Hi Rosie, how are you doing? I'm really good, thank you so much for having me today. No problem at all, it's, it's been uh, great to talk with you over the last few months and years and I guess from my perspective I was really keen to bring you on the show and just discuss some real pressing issues that I think people in the pre-sale space are really you know, struggling with, we talk about diversity, enablement and empathy. Um, so that's basically the topic of today. But just to start with, I'd love just to have the audience hear a bit more about your journey into pre-sales and how that came about. Yeah, sure. So I have a very diverse experience. Uh, initially, I started my career uh, as an international account manager, which sounds really glamorous. It wasn't as glamorous. Uh, but basically dealing with many different uh, clients in ad tech. I then moved to doing a very, very similar role, account management in email marketing. Um, I, I really like trying new things. So I volunteered to get trained on onboarding new customers. So onboarding them in terms of adopting the technology, being with them for the first uh, month. Uh, and then... I came with the idea that maybe I should try something new. A lot of my colleagues were asking me, have I ever uh, thought about going into sales? They were saying that I, I should be good at it, that that's what they feel. And so, so many people said that to me over the years that I thought I'm going to give it a go and try and apply to join uh, the pre-sales team in the company I was working for. And that's how it happened. I became a solutions consultant uh, and I thought, wow, I'm loving it. You don't really need to go as deep as you do when you're in consulting and you're doing the implementation. You just need to kind of overall know everything. I love pitching, I love presenting. So that, that's a key part of the role. Um, and so I did the job for not even two years actually, until I actually thought that maybe there's something different that I want to do. Um, and that took me to the journey of, of leadership, which probably is gonna be your next question. Yeah, definitely. So if if we talk about that journey, after two years in, in the pre-sales role, what really sparked that moment where you knew the next step was gonna be moving into leadership? And how was those in, initial steps moving into leadership when we talk about you know, learning how to mentor people and coach them. It was, I guess, a, a whole new step for you. And, and what, what was the biggest challenges? I just used an opportunity that came about. I was part of a pre-sales team and our manager had resigned. And so we, we didn't have a manager uh, for quite a few months. And... There was no news. We were just freshly acquired by, by a big corporation and there was no news on when a new leader would be joining. And I thought, okay, maybe this is my chance. Maybe I should just give it a go. And I volunteered to run different activities that usually a manager would do. Um, get a team meeting set up for everyone to be getting together once every, uh, every week. Um, I started talking to the leaders in the ecosystem, so sales director, leaders of CSM, leaders of consulting, um, and just trying to navigate, okay, how do we collaborate better together as teams? What are the challenges that we have? What are the key initiatives we can be driving together? Um, and, and so naturally, I felt I quite enjoyed that, and I, I like the sense of having additional responsibility. But also, I felt that it really helped me to try something new um, and without having to commit to, to joining as a, as a manager. So then when the opportunity came about, I thought I'm going to call a meeting with the VP and, and just pitch myself and say, look, I've, I've been doing this on my own for the last few months. I'm quite interested. Um, I'd like to apply to be um, the manager of the team. And at that point, the only role available was for a senior director, which obviously I had no management experience. <laughs> but nevertheless, I said, well, can I apply? What do you think? Um, and the VP said, look, you know, I'm looking for someone really experienced. However, since you're so eager, why not? Let's just give it a go and see what ideas you have. And so I, I did an official interview with the VP 
Um, and he said to me, I'm going to create a role for you. It's not going to be a senior director because you don't have experience. However, um, in the next few months, I'm going to make sure that there is a manager's role and you can go ahead and apply for that. And that's what happened. I wasn't the only one applying, of course, there were others. Um, but luckily, you know, I got the job. And what I think what really helped me was that one, I had already tried performing that role. So people had seen it, whether I'm good or not good at it. So what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? And I had established a really good network at that point. Um, and even preparing for the interview, I think I called a one-on-one -on -one with probably 20 different leaders within the company just for advice and any tips, which, you know, really, really helped during the interview just to show that I've gone so deep into preparing and I know what I'm getting myself into. Um, and, yeah, I was really motivated by just helping, having a bigger mission, I guess, helping everyone get better, but also not just looking at myself and my individual target, but like, what can I do to make a difference as a team? And as a leader, I guess your, your focus, as you mentioned, will shift and rather than your personal goals and KPIs, it's more about developing a team and helping them on their journey to achieving, you know, collective goals. So you have a different, you know, measure of success there, right? And in in those early years as a leader, when when you look back and reflect, would you say that there was some mentors that were involved um, in helping you along your journey? Oh, 100%, yeah. Um, so luckily, I wasn't the only manager of the ecosystem, so th there were a few of us. Um, and yes, they were so welcoming, knowing that I've not been a manager before. Um, and they were really happy to have regular meetings with me. I would always share questions or maybe challenges that I might be having, ask for their opinion, ask for their advice. And I felt really supported really, really well. I, I had many, many challenges when I first became a leader, really difficult situations. I, I recall actually my boss back then telling me, in my entire really long career, I've never had to deal with some of some really difficult moments you had to step into just in your first month of being a manager. So I, I've been thrown in the deep end from, from day one. And was was all of your mentors that were involved personally with yourself, were they directly involved within, you know, the pre-sale space? Or did you ever have mentors that maybe were, you know, external from the organization or maybe came from another area such as product management they were all within the company and i guess if i was successful and we had a shared target it meant that that is helping them as well so they were very motivated to help me um and having you know having a like a true partnership within the ecosystem was really really important as well um I never, I haven't had an external mentor before. Um, it's definitely something I'll be willing to explore if I ever get the chance to do. Um, but yeah, maybe something for the future. Amazing. And if if we go, you know, across to your time at Silver Pop, I guess you it was, you know, probably your first role in pre-sales. How did that differ to when you joined a much larger organization in Oracle. I know Silver Pop was acquired by IBM, so they were a pretty big business within a business, but how did the dynamics change and how was, you know, the approach to pre-sales slightly different? It was extremely different. So when I first became a, a sales engineer at Silver Pop, there was a standard demo, a demo script. You had to learn it and you had to deliver it buy the book, and if you ever dare to do something different, you might be penalized and told off. The trouble is I'm really creative and I don't like going by script and I like trying new things. So very quickly, I felt, you know, I can't be doing five, six demos a day. This is just, it's it's not challenging. It's, it can be boring. It's not really so impactful either. Um, and my expectations as being a solutions consultant there was maybe 
maybe it's just the company, maybe it's just the role, and maybe I should just try it in a, in a different environment. So then when I joined Responses, which got acquired by Oracle, I had to learn or re relearn how to be a, a solutions consultant. I remember doing some training and then my boss back then wanted to see how I do a demo for first time. So I, you know, I, they gave me a recording to watch. I learned the demo exactly as per the recording. I did the demo in front of my boss and he ripped me apart. He said, this is, this is not how we do demos in this company. Um, and I didn't know what they meant. So then they told me, look, first, the whole company uses the challenger sale methodology. So you need to read the book and familiarize yourself with the approach. Then watch how some of the other solutions consultants run their demos and meetings. And so I did that and it immediately clicked. I thought, wow, you know, this is a makes complete sense. It's not so difficult to achieve. Um, and it's a million times more impactful than what, what I what I was used to in my previous role. And so I loved it so, so much that I was excited to work on many different clients and just to use the, the new skills, the new methodology. My advice to anyone, even if Challenger Sales is a really, really old book, but up to today, uh, anyone I work with, I always recommend it. I really love that. And the same with, um, with the um, Demo to Win which many tech companies have adopted. I really like that methodology. Yeah. So I actually remember as a like a new starter in responses, we went to our sales kickoff in, in the US and we had to do a two-day course on uh, Demo to Win, ending with, as a team, do a little pitch. I remember I was in the winning team and I felt really proud because you know I was only in the company for a month um, and... Yeah, I, I just felt, okay, I was born to do that. I really loved it. That's great. And you, you mentioned being on the winning team there and, and the demo to win. I guess demo to win is something that a lot of people in pre-sales know about and, and follow. And from my perspective, it's definitely, you know, something that anyone getting into pre-sales should be, you know, reading and, and learning a lot into that. But if we talk about your early steps, when you joined Oracle and you was, you know, having to have that first, you know, constructive criticism about your pre-sales approach, how, how was it allowing yourself to feel vulnerable and, and taking those, you know, um, criticisms and turning that around? How was that impactful in your career moving forward to elevate and grow your career and your, your knowledge? Well, I felt really confused because I didn't know what was expected of me. And then... I thought, all right, so if my onboarding meant that I had to learn from a video demo and then replicate it, I was really bad onboarding. So I thought, okay, if anyone else joins after me, I would really love to be involved with their onboarding because that is not a good way to teach someone of what is expected of them and how to be a good solutions consultant. And that's exactly what I did. So the people that got hired afterwards, I volunteered to be like the body of, of the person that is that is joining and, and helping with their onboarding. And, and instead of saying, okay, I'll watch this generic demo that someone in product marketing recorded, it was let's start with, you know, this is this is a book you need to read. This is an example of of, of, of um what demo to win is, go on the course, and then now that you understand the key principles, um you can go and have a crack at it and we'll give you feedback and help it get better. Uh, because very often, even to today, when I have new people joining the team, if they never had a pre-sales experience, they just wouldn't know. It's not difficult once, once you've understood the methodology, but if no one ever told you, how are you supposed to know? It just wouldn't. So yeah, it was, it was, you know, it was fine. And, I know at Oracle, there was a number of great leaders there. Some of them I've, I've worked with or spoken with in the past. Um, people like Simon Miles, I'm not sure if he was there when, when you was there at the time in the CX team um, oh. or Karina Benefors. Yeah, Karina was but there. Yeah, in terms of... 
So I, my, and, and did you work with Karina closely? Uh, a bit. So we were in different countries. Um, but yeah, so she, she left uh, much earlier than me. But if you are after a few key names of people that I felt have really helped me to shape my career. Um, so my first manager, uh, after I became a manager, was Darren Mason. So he really, really helped me. And one of my first mentors there was Virginie Crusset. Um, and, you know, she was a complete superstar. We, we were in touch until today. And I have really valued our, our relationship. I always love a shout out on the show. It's, it's always good to recognize some of the people that have helped you on your journey. And as, as we kind of shift the conversation towards diversity and inclusion, I just wanted to ask you in those early years when you were pretty, you new to pre-sales and you were finding your feet, how, how was you able to cope with, you know, the language barrier where you felt maybe at some points that your, your accent was maybe a, a hindrance or a blocker in your progression, how did that personally impact you? And how was you able to kind of overcome that personally? Uh, so the stories about my accents go back in time from before I ever got my first job. Um, it's been a barrier for sure, um, but it's been a barrier when, you know, people have specifically called it out and said that it is because of your accent that you're not going to get the job or you won't be good at your job, uh, which is very heartbreaking to, to hear. You know, accent is something that we can't control. Um, our brain stops working on our accent when we're 12. I moved to the UK when I was 19. Uh, so as much as I try, I can't really change my accent. Maybe it gets a little bit softer with time, but that's about it. Um, so with the first time when I applied to have a pre-sales role and I got the job, we went to celebrate out for drinks with my colleagues in Silverpop. Um, and I was really, really happy. And I approached one of the sales directors just to, to check, well, what is your advice? How do you think I'm going to do in the, in the new um, pre-sales uh, role? And they, they called it out. They said, well, I don't think you're going to do well. You've got an Eastern European accent. Clients are not going to like that. And yeah, that, that was really sad to hear. So the impact of that was that whenever I was in a meeting, I would look around and see, okay, who are the native speakers? Who are the people with accents? If I went on a competition, perhaps, again, same thing. Um, and it, I would feel that I would never be maybe as charismatic as a speaker. Maybe people would discriminate me because it has happened a number of times throughout my career when they've specifically called it out. It is not anything else. It is actually your accent that I feel uh, is the main reason why I won't give you the job. It's definitely hard, and I guess... If we fast forward, you know, 10 years um, forward now, we look at a lot of the big tech companies and a lot of the, you know, regional or, you know, global leaders are those of European or, or you know, other descents where there is an accent, but it doesn't hinder at all their ability to do the job. They're still very successful at leading and communicating with cross-functional teams, with multinational organizations where the, you know, there's, people from all different backgrounds right so from my perspective i've seen so many people grow um in their careers and it doesn't matter i know you will have these these instances where people will say hey you know we're, we're struggling to understand you and things like this but personally i think if you're really focused on the right things you're able to understand the customer's needs work with the right stakeholders and achieve the common goal right so that's what the customer wants most is for you to understand their pains and be able to help them to solve their problems. So I don't think, you know, at this point in your career now, you look back and I guess now when you're hiring people into organi organizations like Adobe, there is, you know, such a, a diverse culture and people from all different backgrounds and you have different segments that they focus in. Are you somebody that tries to empower and hire people across all different backgrounds and let them know of your experiences and that, it shouldn't be something that mentally is a blocker for them. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, as you probably know from my LinkedIn, I'm a massive advocate of diversity inclusion and, and I'm trying to raise the topic of accent bias because a lot of people have never heard of it. And it's only when you actually call it out uh, that people would be ashamed to ever use it as a discrimination factor. So I work for a, a very inclusive company and at Adobe, even the CEO and the senior leadership team, they all come from different backgrounds. They all have different accents. So that for me is really empowering. If they made it to the top of one of the most successful companies in the world, well, why should anyone be, be worried about it? Um, and yes, I, I've got an accent myself, right? So if I'm hiring, I would never discriminate someone because of that. I'm looking at, at their skills, at their ability, uh, in pre-sales, obviously, things like presentation skills, technical skills, problem solving, uh, objection handling, all the usuals, more so than whether they have an accent or not. I understand. And we're going to dive in, in a moment just into your work with the accent biased workshop that you did with the women in tech, because I'd love to hear a bit more about that. But just from my own experiences, I would say, even being born in the UK, I still feel that my accent maybe isn't the same as some of the people that you, you come to expect working in the corporate world. So I also sometimes feel like I suffer from that syndrome of, of, of being an imposter. And I guess many people do, uh, especially in that diverse background and, and even women as well, when they're coming up, trying to um, gain that traction into leadership roles. So that's something that that's always going to be present. But as long as communities and, and organizations work together to really make a clear initiative to c combat this, I think that's something that will help the next generation of, of tech specialists. And if we go into, you know, your, your involvement then into the accent bias workshop, I'd love just to hear a little bit more about how that was for you, some of the key things that were brought up and how you really helped people that are suffering from that to understand that anything is possible and help to work with them to, you know, improve their experiences. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I, I um, have had this as a personal goal to start raising awareness of accent bias. And I had this vision a few years back thinking, wow, you know, I would like to be on stage, maybe do a TED talk on the topic, but it felt like a really distant dream. And when I joined the Dolby, um, I shared my vision with my colleagues and I said, look, this is a topic that is very close to my heart. Would it be of interest if I did a talk on the topic, maybe a little workshop? Um, and immediately there was loads of interest. So I joined one of the women at Adobe um, internal uh, sessions and I did a little workshop on the topic. I shared loads of research that proves that accent bias exists. I shared my personal stories because it was important for me to show that it, you can struggle. This is what can happen to you. However, there is a happy ending. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with, with my achievements. I'm happy with my career. So this should never be a barrier. Um, and the feedback was, was incredible. I had so many people sending me messages and calling me and, and, and being really happy that I have uh, run the session. And one of my colleagues on the back of it said, look, this is, this is really good. I've been talking to women at tech and I've been telling them about you uh, and you need to talk to them and, and, and run a session for them. So then I met with, with Angie uh, and I shared... Uh, my topic with her and she was really keen to book me on a masterclass. So I ran the masterclass and then on the back of it, um, I had a, a lovely lady from Sage Publishing contacting me and, and saying, I loved it. It's very inspirational. Would you mind running the same event um, at our company during our diversity event? Um, and of course, I agreed right away. And we had that event uh, just a few weeks back. Uh, and I like posting on LinkedIn just to promote the topic. And even here, I can, I can use that as an open invitation to anyone uh, listening to say that I'm really happy to join any virtual or on-site event and just share 
information to a talk to a presentation around accent bias because for me it's really important as many people as possible to hear about this topic to understand that it exists but also to hear what we could be doing to to reduce the impact of accent bias when when you were running these um master classes was there any standout instances where somebody had experiences that they had shared or was it more you telling your story and amplifying it to to the to the wider audience it was very interactive so everyone was sharing stories i i always start by sharing first because people sometimes could feel it's daunting talking in front of others about yeah. their biggest vulnerabilities um but but then yeah lots of people joined and shared stories about First, if they have an accent, what has happened to them, how they feel about it, how it shapes the perception of others. But equally, people with native accents were able to share whether they ever felt that accent exists, that accent barriers exist, and also to ask questions for advice. You know, what, what is your advice if, if I'm a native speaker, but how can I make it easier for people to, with, with accents? Amazing. And I guess, you know, in your position where you are now and, and with the audience that you have and, and the connections on LinkedIn, I guess is such a powerful platform. And when people can actually see leaders showing their vulnerability and, you know, being able to share their stories, people really resonate with that, which is, you know, something that I find very much so. And, and that's why people like yourself, I, I love to follow and, you know, like your comments and even try to interact with them as well as best as I can. But if we, you know, move forward to your time at Adobe, it seems like it was a very pivotal moment for you to grow as a person and in confidence with, you know, not worrying about your accent. And, you know, we know, both know that they've been recognized for so many awards of, you know, diversity and also being a great place to work. And it seems that they're, they're also very open to the idea of employees voicing, you know, initiatives that could bring you know, the right exposure to the organizations, but also allowing them to um, feel empowered and, and to share their experiences. And is another instance was, you know, being a, a mother, of course, and being in a corporate job, you've got to manage the balance of going to the office now with the hybrid working. Is that something that was difficult in the beginning? Or, or maybe if that was the situation at organizations in the past, it would have been very difficult. To be completely honest, I have absolutely no idea how parents did it 10 years ago. Uh, when I was working back in, in AOL and Silver Pop, it was every day in the office, 9 to 5, even if you're five minutes late, calling HR to tell them you're late. I would have never been able to do it today. It, it's so mentally draining. So when I uh, used to work for Oracle, especially as the pandemic approached, I was fully remote. And I did appreciate the fact that it's very easy to manage childcare. You just do your quick drop off, your home, you can do your cooking, you can do your, your chores at home, no time wasted on commute. Then when I joined Adobe, the pandemic was already ending. Um, and of course, being in a new role, it's really important that you start meeting people, you introduce yourself, you, you network, you build your network. Um, so I, I was trying to go to the office once, twice a week at least. And the reason why I found it very challenging is because it also clashed with um, a lot of personal challenges with my family. So coincidentally, exactly as I joined Adobe, um, I didn't have solid childcare. I was using a childminder who had to move outside of London. So this meant that um, back then my one-year-old son didn't have any care. So I had to be looking for nurseries, for nannies, for anything I could find. And if you live in London, it's very, very difficult to secure a place with just one or two months notice. Um, and then in the same time, my, my uh, daughter was starting reception at school. Um, and it meant that for the entire month of September, she would have settling sessions, going for three hours a, a day. Um, and it was really difficult to think, how can I you know, even drop off or pick up? And that's in the middle of the day. But in the same time, I had to go to the office. Um, it was really, really challenging. Um, so luckily, I was able to secure a nanny to help out here and there. But 
you know, you, have, you want to be present in a new job. You want to be there building your connections, proving yourself. In the same time, if your kids are starting school for first time, nursery for first time, you also need to be present there. You want to be there the first time you bring them to school, the first time you bring them to nursery, chat with the teachers, find out what is the feedback. So trying to do, to be 100% present both at work and as a mom was extremely challenging. And I just, I, I was so stressed out and I was trying to, to chat with people at work and ask, you know, who here has kids? Can you give me some tips? How did you make it work? I had no idea there are so many school holidays and so many inset days. And that's way more than my annual leave. Uh, how, how would that work? And yes, I, I started connecting with people at work, but I was really surprised to find out that, you know, Adobe is a company with many different networks, women network, pride network, men net, the black um, employee network. But there was nothing for parents, just it didn't exist as an official network or community. And I really felt the need at that point. I thought if there was something, it, it would have really helped me. And since there was nothing, I thought I'm going to pick my, put my hand up and see if I can create a parent's community at Adobe. And... Luckily, I wasn't the only person that had the same idea. So I, I was able to find a few other very eager parents that wanted to join me. And we formed our little um, like a leadership committee. We discussed how we can launch the community. Um, and I'm happy to say that as of a few months back, the parents community at Adobe is officially live. And... Every month we host events for all of the parents at Adobe, um, also including people who are yet to be parents. So they, they're trying to conceive or they're expecting or maybe carers as well. So maybe your stepmom, stepdad, or you, you're trying to adopt. So it's very inclusive. And, and every month we have a different topic uh, that gets voted by all the employees. So what do you want to talk about this month? We've got a, every month we have a special guest, one of the senior leadership uh, representatives. They would share their parenting journey. And it can be really reassuring when you have a senior leader say, you know what, it's okay to go to parents evening. It's okay to go to a club for a child and see them at school. And when you hear that from a senior leader, you feel, okay, if they can do that, then it's okay. I don't need to always ask for permission and it's okay for me to juggle my family and, and my... Well, congratulations to you and uh, your colleagues that managed to build out the parents' community and build that platform for people to express their, you know, challenges with parenthood, but also those trying to become parents and in similar situations. And I guess, as you mentioned, it gives you a lot of hope when you listen to senior leaders within the organization sharing those stories and letting you know that it is possible. We go, you know, I speak to some people that have been in sales and pre-sales for 20 years and they say, look, you know, 20 years ago, I had to run um, in between meetings and, and go to these parents' evenings and, and those kind of events just to be able to be present in your kid's life. And sometimes we look at a career and, and how important it is to try and you always feel like you're competing with other people in the organization to get promoted and you don't want to, it almost feels like slipping up if you take an hour out to go to your kid's parents' evening, but it is so important to still be present in their life and to show them that there is time for them as well. So now the world we live in is, is more, more adoptive of this and, you know, that's great. And I guess from your perspective, the, there's an element I, I read um, on your post that you talked about the biggest regrets and was there a lot of big nuggets that you and other people got to take away from not only leaders, but people maybe at a similar level or, you know, lower down the organization that have shared some, some great stories? Yeah, absolutely. So there is so many mistakes we make as we first become parents. And usually with every, with every consecutive child, we get better and better. But it was really valuable to, to hear and learn from others' mistakes so you don't have to make the mistakes yourself and see what has worked for everyone. 
Um, and to be honest, um, a very, very key takeaway that many people shared on that event was the fact that perhaps they didn't spend enough time with their children and they prioritized work a little bit too much. And maybe it was okay to take a bit of a longer maternity leave. Um, and maybe it was okay to visit the, the school events of your child and maybe you know, make it up working in the evening later. Um, so it was, yeah, it, it was really great to hear all of those learnings and all of those stories. And I, I, especially people who are yet to become parents, you know, I would have absolutely loved to hear all of that as I was expecting my first child. I think one of the upcoming topics that we are going to have is actually about that. So how do you plan and like, do you postpone your career? Do you postpone family, family planning? And, you know, I remember um, when I got pregnant for first time, it really coincided with me being a, a new manager. And, and I was a manager only for a year at that point. And I was so nervous, so, so nervous to tell work that I'm, I'm pregnant and I'm going to be away for six months. And I spent so long looking online, researching, Googling, how have people in my situation made it work? What happened to them? How was that? How, how did it impact their career? And I didn't find anything. Like literally nothing online about people who are new managers expecting a, a child. And so this is what actually pushed me. I think for first time ever sharing on LinkedIn about something personal, not strictly work related. Um, and so when I when I went on maternity leave. Two people who are part of my team were my maternity cover who then got promoted to managers themselves. So I, I wrote an article on that topic because I felt this is, I really hope people who, who are Googling and who are nervous would come across the article and they're going to see that the story can be extremely positive and they shouldn't be worried at all. Um, and I thought from then onwards, actually sharing about my personal life, my personal experience with my professional network could come across as, as very encouraging and, and a lot of people even say inspirational. So this is this is how I even I changed um, as a person on, on LinkedIn throughout the years. And you, you mentioned the article that you posted around that, I guess, any from my perspective anyway any any company that values their employees and the work that they do everyone's entitled to, to to have leave right and you know having children is something magical and, and something that you definitely need to take some time to build that initial bond with the kids so generally you know as you mentioned having only just moved into leadership i can appreciate the the, the concern and you know the the worry that there was there but you know, you had more than capable team members to step in and it gave them a, a chance to be exposed to that leadership activity and grow as people as well. So it was it seemed to be a win win for most people uh, involved in that. And going forward now, when you then had your second child, I guess you was more comfortable letting the employer know that, you know, I'm, I've got some good news. I'm going to be a mother again. And it means I will take some time off. But you then don't feel as pressured right into letting the team know that there's going to be a change and giving a full handover. Yeah. So the second time when I was announcing, I was very excited. Whereas the first time I was extremely nervous. The second time when I was pregnant, that, that clashed with the pandemic and we were fully remote and no one knew that I was pregnant up until very late in my pregnancy because all they could see is my face during Zoom calls. Um, but I mean, here to my mind comes another really important topic that I'm sure many people or many parents to be have experienced. You always have on the back of your mind that if you are ever away for six months or a year, would, would your promotion ever happen? And, and this is what was always front of my mind as I got pregnant the second time around. I was, I was due to be promoted. And when I fell pregnant, I thought, I'm not going to share with my work because I want to wait it out and see whether my promotion comes through. Because what if I say that I'm pregnant and then the promotion never happens? 
And I remember waiting and waiting and waiting and it wasn't happening. And when I was like coming to, to the very deadline by law, when I had to tell them, I thought, okay, well, I have no choice. Now I have to tell them I'm pregnant. And of course, everyone was very shocked. But again, I was very fortunate because just before I went on maternity leave, I did get my promotion. So that, that was, you know, very, very good news for me. But not everyone is so fortunate. Um, so, you know, sharing worries like that, speaking out loud about such big issues for me is really, really important. And, you know, this is the reason um, why very recently at Adobe, uh, me and, and a colleague of mine um, hosted an event about women in solution consulting. And we wanted all of those taboo topics to come out people to have a secure space where they can share, ask questions, have people who have gone through such challenging situations explain what happened to them and what helped them and what mistakes perhaps they, they made um, and, and have all of those people who are perhaps really worrying before things have even happened, ask, ask the questions and get the reassurance. And um if would you say having these female groups to to share their stories and you know have a platform to to help others to navigate those challenges have been instrumental for you personally and give you a, a big you know meaning of fulfillment personally yeah absolutely and i'm just regretful that the, these things didn't exist you know, 10 years ago when i was at that stage thinking about career and progression and starting a family. I, I wish someone back then organized an event like that for me so I can ask all my questions. Um, but yeah, the, the feedback was, was really positive by people who attended. Um, and, and this is what is motivating me to run more of those events. And I'm already starting to plan the next one. Uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's massively rewarding when you have people come and join and, and share positive feedback and, and are grateful for it. Amazing. And anyone that is a woman in tech, I would recommend connecting with Rosie and, and li listening out for some of these initiatives and be, you know, be sure to, to reach out and connect with her if you want to be a part of that. I think it's going to be something special you continue to do. And just on the topic of empathy, I want to briefly just touch on before I, I ask you some quick fire questions um, and a question from a previous guest. So in terms of empathy, I guess, we we talked about a range of things around accent bias you know being a first time mother how important was empathy for you from the employers but also as a leader now to the team so i i'm finding that the levels of empathy have really changed in some, inside me ever since i became a mother i i really feel that all my chemicals and hormones have completely transformed me to be so much more empathetic ever since I became a mother. Um, and of course, then make my expectations from, from others being empathetic to me. My employer have also uh, changed a bit, so I'm expecting a little bit more. Um, I feel that I'm so much better able to understand um, or like feel for, for people when they're, they're having a hard time, they're in a difficult situation. Um, and I really believe that if someone is, is happy as a person, then they're gonna be performing much better in their job. So the actual well-being and the, the happiness of each of the employees or my team members for me is really, really important. And do you have any specific enablement um initiatives that you run for the team to kind of give them the the platform to, to grow personally into where they want to go. Some people, as you know, move outside of pre-sales, but they will have a clear goal in mind that they want to achieve. And is there an enablement program that you run with Adobe to, to help grow the people in your team? Yeah, so career growth is really important for me. And right at the start, when I joined Adobe, I realized that uh, career progression was an area of growth. A lot of the employees at Adobe were saying that they want to they want to hear more about career progression um, and development. 
And so on the back of that, we did a brainstorm workshop with the people in my team to, to see what exactly are the gaps, what are they, they, they looking to do. And on the back of that, I launched a series of career development days. Uh, a career development day was for the entire solution consulting organization, um, where we spent the whole day together. We had guest speakers from the rest of the ecosystem. So sales, sales specialists, customer success, consulting, leadership, all share what it is like to work for their department because people wanted clarity and they wanted to see if I ever decided to try something new outside of solution consulting, I want to have the transparency. Some of the people uh, that joined the event had even made the move between one role to the other, which was really useful. We had some inspirational speakers talking about as a senior leader, how did I make it? What helped me to grow into my career? Um, and then we had um, us splitting into mini teams and, and having a more emotional part of the, um, of the event where everyone could share an example of how they um, have achieved a big development goal that they had on their personal development plan and who helped them and what helped them. Uh, and the event was really, really well received. Um, and on the back of that, we, we had a, a few other workshops run because the, the feedback was so positive. Um, and then again, like on that topic of career development and career progression, I'm very lucky that uh, the company I worked for has an education fund. So all the employees can spend up to $10,000 per year on any training and development certifications, courses. Um, and uh, every month uh, for this year, I was running education um, fund events within Adobe, having a different guest speaker every time who has used the education fund for different uh, courses. So we had people who have done coaching courses. We've had people who have done sustainability courses, um, different master's degrees, and they were all sharing what the course was like and how they how it helped them professionally to maybe get a promotion or to develop a new skill. And the whole idea was that more people would get inspired to use their education fund um, and look at you know, what what new skills they could be developing and which courses could inspire them to to go to the next stage. That's that's amazing. I, I, I talk to a lot of people in the pre-sale space and I guess when they're aspiring and, and growing their career, something that they always talk about is having, you know, the the tools to develop new skills, to have some sort of education fund or, you know, resources for them to further develop. And that's something that a lot of companies are fortunate enough to offer. And those that don't, obviously they they risk people wanting to make a move where they can continue to have a, a steep learning curve and elevate further. And I guess having that at Adobe and for the team specifically, it helps you to ensure that you're pretty close to the team and you really understand their key drivers, right? Because not everyone is driven by money, some by, you know, educational growth, others by leading people. So I guess for you as a successful leader is, understanding your team and building a personal relationship with them vital for you to to have a great team and to understand you know how to make them happy and, and driven yeah absolutely so a lot of people throughout my career have made comments and told me that i'm one of the managers that is most focused on career development and people development um, and it's a massive massive driver for me um, not only like for me to develop myself, but anyone I'm working with, whether that's someone directly within my team, whether that's someone from the um, ecosystem, giving feedback for me is really important. I always like to it with the feeling that I want people to get better and, and, and progress. Um, it's really important for me that people in, in, in the team have uh, personal development plans and that I know exactly what I need to be helping them with, uh, that I can find them mentors, that I can 
recommend them the, the best, I guess, shadowing experiences they can join or connect them with, with people from other teams if this is of interest to them. Um, so, yeah, very, very, very important. For nice. And just last of all, before we start to summarize everything, I always like to ask my guests a question that's close to me, which is what is the biggest lessons you've learned on your journey and, and how was you able to you know, use those experiences to be a better leader? A big lesson for me has been that you need to be curious and always follow your ideas and keep trying new things. I really believe that the reason I have been successful in my journey is because I'm constantly trying new things. My head is so busy with ideas. New ideas come up every time, every day. And they, I don't just disregard them. I keep sharing with people. And I like, like I'm, I'm quite quick. So if, if I decide that there's, I have this idea and I want to see it, I want to I wanna make it a, a reality. I'm just going to go for it and you know, mobilize the team of people that can help me make it happen and just go with it. Um, and that my advice is don't be afraid and also don't wait for perfection. It, for me, it's much better to just get something up and running, learn, you know, maybe you're going to make some mistakes, but you're going to perfect it eventually. But if you're always looking for, I'm only going to make it or I'm only going to, to go for my idea when everything is completely thought through and completely perfect, that's going to take forever and maybe nothing is going to happen at the end. So, yeah, this is my, my, my learning and my advice to everyone listening. Great. And the question I have from another guest for yourself is, what was the most interesting project that you've been involved in and what did you learn from it? To be honest, a lot of the examples I shared today are probably some of the most interesting ones. Uh, so st starting the... The um, family, uh, sorry, the Adobe um, parents community. So that's has been very, very interesting. Uh, the different volunteering experiences that I, I have joined uh, while being at Adobe and Oracle. So I'm volunteering at the Inspiring Leadership Foundation, for example. That has been incredible. Organizing the different events has given me just so much motivation. I, it was a big personal goal of me to be doing more public speaking and presenting in events. So organizing the career development days, organizing the education fund events, um, organizing the women in solution consulting event, all of that have been like really big peak. And on the client side as well. So recently I was the host of the content supply chain bootcamp at Adobe, which I absolutely loved as well. Um, so most interesting, probably anything that gives me the chance to share my ideas, see them through and um, just help inspire more people. Nice. And is there a question that you have for the next guest that you would like to share? My question for the next guest is, as a people manager, what is the hardest part of your job? Interesting. And last of all is our quick fire question. So, the first question I have for you, Rosie, is what is your favorite holiday destination that you've been to so far? Mexico must be my favorite once. It was way before the kids. So much to do and see, and I did it just in a week. Nice. And are you a pet person? And if so, what what is your favorite pet? Uh, I used to have different dogs when I was little. And I had a German Shepherd for 13 years. Uh, today we have fishes at home. However, I found it so difficult to deal with the death of my long-term pet that I've said to my family, I, I do not want to have any, any more dogs because I just don't think I can take it. And what, what is the fav your favorite meal that you make at home for the kids and your husband? Oh, meal times are very complicated. So me and my husband recently went to a plant-based diet. 
The kids, however, they eat the typical kids' food, so I usually tend to make different variations of dinner for everyone. Um, but we do love our plant-based burgers with my husband, and that's one that also the kids use um, and like. Amazing. Do you make them from scratch? No. <laughs> I get Beyond Burgers, our <laughs> favorite. <laughs> Perfect. And just last of all, what what would you say is your favorite movie of all time? It's a really difficult question. If you ever ask me for a favorite, I, I never have just one favorite. Um, yeah. I, yeah, it's a really, really hard one. I, I, Anything that pops I, to mind? Doesn't need to be a favorite, just one that you really like then. Honestly, nothing comes to mind right now. <laughs> I watch Netflix every right, single well, evening, but... It, it becomes hard after a while, especially after lockdown, watching Netflix so much, you then, you know, find find it hard to find something to watch. But Rosie, it's been great having you as a guest on, on the show. Some amazing insights. I really enjoyed talking about some of those uh, deep-hitting subjects. And um, I look forward to following some of your initiatives and for anyone in tech that want to hear about some of these initiatives that may be have impacted you personally, be sure to connect with Rosie. Rosie, take care, enjoy your week off, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you so much for having me. Bye. No problem. Bye-bye.